My name is Kathy Minden, and I'm a member of League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County. And this is our public information meeting for the month of September 2013. And we're having a recap today of the 2013 legislative session that our state representatives represented East County about. We all know that we have many issues and concerns, and it's really helpful to realize that these people are working on solutions, that there are solutions to these issues and concerns that we have. So they're going to give us an update, and on my far right is Representative Chris Gorsick and Lori Monis anderson our state senator, and Representative Greg Matthews. They'll each have about 15 minutes. I know that that's very narrow, <laughs> but uh, at the end there will also be an opportunity for questions from the audience, and we'll give you as much information as we can in this period of time. So Representative Gorsuch, would you mind going first? Sure. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, hopefully everybody's doing well today. Uh, I am uh, Chris Gorsick. I live in uh, Troutdale, which is the lovely gateway to the gorge. I um, live there with my family, my wife and my two children, and uh, we lived in Troutdale for a number of years. Um, we had some interesting challenges. Uh, I say we because um, it's not just you when you get elected, but it's also your family to some degree that goes along for the ride. And so um, we found that uh, being a freshman legislator was not uh, always as easy as one might think. Um, juggling home and work, uh, because I still work as a teacher at Mount Hood Community College, and then the legislature uh, makes for a very full schedule. Um, we also found um, in this session, uh, being new, uh, there was a lot to learn. And uh, from what I could gather from people with much more experience, like my colleagues here, uh, we started off pretty fast this session. And so not only learning what you have to learn as a, as a new person, but then having it come at you much faster than you thought it would, uh, the learning curve was pretty steep. So. Um, it's a fascinating place, the legislature, and uh, um, I think a lot of times people, if they do go to Salem, they might see the building, they might even come inside and sit in the gallery, but I don't know that they really have a full feel for what goes on um, inside. I think uh, we get painted in a pretty broad brush, those of us in politics, and so when you hear all the time about things going on, that aren't so great in Congress, which seems somewhat stalled at the present time. I think people feel that that's also what happens at the state and the local level. Uh, the truth of the matter is that my colleagues um, uh, from both sides of the aisle in the House, I've seen it also in the Senate, um, we pass a lot of legislation and deal with a lot of the state's day-to-day -day issues all the time. Um, and we pass a majority of the things that need to be taken care of with budgets and different uh, new laws and things that come along. Uh, I think we do a pretty good job. Now, I'm, I'm new, but based on my, my, uh, what I've seen this session, I think that we've done a pretty good job. Um, there's always going to be things that hang you up, you know, um, in terms of uh, certain political views. And so we certainly saw some struggles with that related to the budget. Um, but overall, most of the time, we all vote in unison, or fairly much in unison, which is a really wonderful thing to see, that um, both Democrats and Republicans are able to do the state's business pretty well. So don't judge us by Congress. That's all I can tell you. Um, now, uh, we did a, a number of things that were really important, I think, uh, for East County, and some of them are statewide, but they're also important for us. One thing was the uh, school budget, $6.7 billion, $75 billion, um, is a huge number. We increased it by a billion dollars, is that right? A billion dollars, think about how substantial that is. Now I know that it doesn't fix all of our problems, but it certainly 
sends us on the way towards making things better for our school kids. And, and really, education is, is the, the key piece to the rest of our state. You need good education so that people can get good jobs and help to pay their taxes and make everything run the way uh, we hope it will run. So um, to, uh, to have done that is an amazing feat, I think. Um, I realize I'm patting myself on the back, but you know, it really, it, it was a very important thing. Um, I had a, um, a keen interest in, in local transportation. Uh, I have, you know, I've been teaching about it for years and, and had some experience with it when I was on the Troutdale City Council. So um, TriMet and issues related to TriMet are really um, important. I think again, because if people can't get to where they need to be, um, especially if they're going on uh, to their job or whatever and do not have a car, which many people um, in, um, in many circumstances struggle with, they need to be able to get to that job and they need to be able to do it fairly rapidly. And, uh, you know, we've encountered, when I was in Troutdale City Council, we heard a lot of stories of people being frustrated with the system. I certainly heard it on the doors when I was campaigning. And so, um, we were able to pass a bill that will call for the Secretary of State's office to do a full audit of TriMet. Now, TriMet gets um, money audits all the time. This is an audit to look at the bigger picture. How does it operate? Um, how does the political structure work or not work within the system? How, um, how could it be improved? The key thing here is not to tear it down but to figure out what's wrong and try to fix those things and enhance the things that do work well. So um, that, I think, is a, is a big step forward, especially for East County, because um, if any of you have taken public transit out here, we know that there are challenges, um, especially our north-south connectors um, are somewhat inadequate. Um, I'm also um, involved with a bill that is going to look at the full 17 community colleges in the state, including Mount Hood, where I work, and uh, work to find out how we can create a unified community college um, system for child care. One of the things that I experience all the time as a teacher there is people who are homeless and have kids and have nowhere to take their kids. And in some cases, uh, if they're not, um, plugged in properly, they can't get into Head Start, which we do have a very fine facility at Mount Hood. Uh, we also have a lot of um, students that are not doing well, but they're not doing poorly enough to qualify for mm. Head Start, and so um, they have a really serious challenge trying to find childcare so that they can go to school, so that they can get a better job, and hopefully then you know improve their, their families' um, lives. And so we wanna find a way uh, across the system to make child care affordable for students. Um, we don't want child care to be a barrier to people moving forward and moving up in their lives. So, so that's another piece um, that we're going to be working on at least this um, in the next year or two. Um, and then there are some other things. Uh, we were able to get uh, funding, some funding for the um, uh, the courthouse, which there are several courthouses across the state that are not in very good shape. And so we got some money for that. And we also, of course, um, got some uh, very important funding uh, to continue the gang enforcement team activities in East Multnomah County. And, and of course, Greg and Lori were really key to getting that taken care of. So we were all worked very hard for that. Um, it's something that we you know, there's more to do, but having that piece of funding helps a lot in terms of dealing with some of the challenges that we face out here in East County. Um, there are some other things that uh, the legislature passed. One of them is a really interesting, um, it's the Oregon Low Income Community Jobs Initiative, and that's to um, give incentives to businesses to uh, operate and invest in low income areas, and certainly we have some of those challenges here. Um, we also have the development of the Office of Small Business Assistance, um, which hopefully will help small businesses sometimes, and many of you may 
have experienced this yourself. Small business owners frequently run into problems and bottlenecks in terms of trying to um, get permits and other things taken care of. So hopefully this will help streamline that process. Because one thing we know across the state, even though we tend to tell the stories of the Nikes and the Intels and, and the big uh, folks, and they're important, but we know that you know, the key job creators in the state are actually small, small and medium-sized businesses. So um, we're heading back to Salem. Seems like we just left. We get to go back to Salem um, next week. We have three days. They're uh, legislative days. And so we'll get a chance to get some more informational um, hearings done and get prepared for the short session, which is this coming winter. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue doing the things that need to be done for our constituents out here in East Multnomah County. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Gorsuch. I'm going to continue with the representative, representative um, and have Greg Matthews go next. And we have the challenges. I, I'm glad that transportation was brought up because the north-south connectors are very crucial. So we'll, we'll have time for questions, further questioning. So Greg, would you please give us a, your insights? Well, thank you very much, and uh, my name is Greg Matthews. I'm state representative for House District 50, which is Gresham, uh, my hometown. I'm in my third term right now, and uh, just excited and privileged to serve. It's been a real honor. Uh, when Chris made mention that he was patting himself on the back, I would say it's due, and, and credit is deserved. Uh, did a great job down there, and we did a great job working together, I think, as three folks that disagree on some issues but agree on a lot of things. And what I want you to remember is that when you're seeing campaign material from, regardless of party, from anybody running for office, it's always about education. It's always, everybody in this state says they support education. My issue is, then let's put it at the forefront. Let's make sure that it matters, and let's make that a priority. And I think we did that. Uh, the governor first released a proposal in his budget that was, uh, quite honestly, ridiculously low. And, and yet I understand he has to do that. By law, he has to submit a budget that can pass with the current resource, but we decided that wasn't enough. And we knew it wasn't gonna be comfortable, we knew it wasn't gonna be easy, we had to go into places where we wish we wouldn't, uh, you know, give them purrs and whatnot, and I'll get to that shortly. But at the end of the, end of the day, despite having 278 million, I think is the number of a revenue forecast that we never even planned on, uh, we were still able to make bold moves to increase the education funding by a billion dollars. And we have a colleague down there uh, who I believe, uh, Dennis Richardson, uh, who uses that term and says, billions and billions of dollars. So there you go, Dennis, a little shout out to you. But <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge number when you're talking about $6.75 billion for education and what that was able to do. Now I want to be clear, it, it didn't solve all the problems, it's not going to. Uh, Gresham Barlow District, as an example, still served pink slips to I think about 27 people. Those are people that will receive jobs despite the amount of attention we're getting for a billion dollar increase to a budget. But I'm also going to tell you there was nothing that we could do to reinstate those jobs. No amount was going to get that done uh, in the conversations I had had. So even going back into the special session doesn't solve the problem for Gresham Barlow. And you may have questions about that and we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Um, as far as PERS goes, uh, a lot of folks were screaming for PERS reform. They wanted us to do something. And there were some areas that needed to be addressed, and, and we, did, we did that. Um, it's unfortunate uh, because I am just not a partisan person. I really am not. I think we're better together. Uh, you know, as the good representative stated, uh, you know, we work together on vast majority of bills. We do get votes on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we, there's a couple thousand bills that were passed out of our chambers. Uh, that's a lot of bills to keep track of. So if I see anybody on the street and they say, hey, House Bill, you know, 23, one, don't expect me to know. But tell me the substance of it and I'll bet we'll get there. But the reality is that PERS was one of those issues that some folks wanted to do more. Some folks weren't willing to go as far as we went. And others decided we have to do something. It's all about the kids. And we did. And we did it. Uh, and, and it had to do with, with uh, the COLA on the public employee retirement system. Uh, we made some adjustments to the COLA. And, uh, and to be honest, that, that does impact retirees, and that's unfortunate. That will be challenged in court, and that's unfortunate. 
the reality is the courts will decide whether or not that was legal to do or not. By constitution, I think they've got a good argument uh, to, to stop that. But also, at stake was this billion dollars of funding for kids to do better than we were, we were going to do. But I want to keep, it, keep you in mind that you might want to do more, but we didn't fall into this hole overnight. We're not going to get it out of it overnight. And if we go out there and tax our businesses further today, when we were just told we have $278 million more coming in, that's really not the strategy I want to take. I want the economy to recover. I want our businesses to recover. I want our citizens to recover. And I want them to have faith, respect, and trust for their government, particularly state. You hinted to what's going on in Congress, and they can have it. But at the state level, this is our hometown. You know, I know, uh, you know I'm a Gresham High School graduate. I know the good senator is as well. Um, you know, uh, her father's a legend there. Uh, our names are throughout this county, and we've worked hard to do that. Um, I don't want those tarnished in a spat. That's ridiculous. But the reality is, this takes some time. It takes some time working together, both sides of the aisle, come to common ground, and then move us forward. And I think that's what we're getting. Uh, as I say, PERS was fully funded in 2007. Uh, then comes the economy crash. And now I think what's occurring, in my opinion, is the window of opportunity is starting to close because the economy is recovering. The PERS unfunded liability is reducing, and people are starting to lose the argument that PERS is breaking the bank. Now, there's some things that we could do. We adjusted the out-of-state PERS. Nobody intended for somebody that moved out of Oregon to not pay the state income tax. That was never part of the deal. We did that. The COLA adjustment, we've done that. But I think there's a point where you say, we have made our move. Now we want to see how it plays out. And that's, that's where I happen to be. Um, we did some other things. You know, you might recall in 2012 when we were kind of running the gamut of uh, foreclosures and, and uh, we were talking about how uh, East County is suffering so many foreclosures. And we had passed a bill in the short session in 2012 that we thought would address that and give people some relief. And what it would do was stop the dual track mortgaging and force people to mediation. So that when our citizens have a hard time paying for their home, they can get into a mediation program that says, we can afford to do 1100 a month, but we can't afford 1375. Can we just make adjustments? Can we just have a mediator? Can we find a way to work? Well, unfortunately, we passed that in 2012, and then shortly thereafter, uh, some folks that were doing some of the lending found a way around it. So we came back in in 13 trying to, trying to rectify that, and I, I think we've, we've gotten there. Um, I can tell you, having helped some constituents with that issue, trying to get them into mediation, trying to get them to stay in their home, it is really frustrating when folks want to stay in their home when they're doing all they can to afford their home. They don't want to uproot their kids, and yet they find out that their property was already sold or it's already on the market, and, and they had no idea. That, that is just really uh, unnecessary. It's shameful. And so we put a stop to that. And again, it doesn't happen in the House alone. The House cannot pass a bill. We need the Senate chambers as well, and then the governor needs a sign. And, and I've just really been honored to work with Senator Monis Anderson on a number of issues. And some things we fall short of the mark. But other things, we talk about what's it going to take to get out of the Senate because we have the votes in the House or vice versa, and we get there. Her leadership on the issues, her time and tenure is, is really meaningful to this process, particularly for this community. And what's nice is we're all from the area. We all have a vested interest here. This is where we serve. It's where we live. It's what we do. And this is where our friends and family are. I didn't know party affiliation with my friends and family prior to running for office. Um, in fact, uh, they know mine now simply because it shows up on my name. But... Uh, the reality is, if you pass good policy because it's good policy, and you use the process to do so, you can defend that. And you can defend that anywhere. Even when people disagree, they still at least understand your process. But if you're doing it differently, if you're making a deal behind a back door, if you're voting for something you hate because somebody voted for something they hate, that's where you get into trouble. Proud to say I don't, I don't vote trade. Uh, not, my, not my deal. Uh, votes stand on their own merit individually, and, uh, and I continue that mantra into my third term. Now, I had the, uh, you can call it unfortunate assignment or fortunate assignment of being assi uh, assigned to the Joint Committee on Public Safety. The expectation there is we would save over $42 billion, or million dollars, I'm sorry, and those monies would be turned back into the community to deal with, uh, you know, problems related to uh, crime and, and whatnot. Nowhere at any time do we discuss releasing violent offenders at all, nothing. Any conversation we had was on day forward things, and a lot of it was very early on, Measure 11's off the table. So I tell you that because in any forum, I want to take every opportunity to make sure people understand that we do care about this community. 
I raised my family here. I've got three daughters. They are 12, 9, and 8. To think that we own a commercial daycare. We have 23 employees and roughly 78 kids a day there. To think that I would release a violent offender knowingly into the community, that would just be shameful. Not that at all. But can we come up with a better policy? Can we come up with a better, a better strategy? Can we do positive outcomes and do some evidence-based outcomes for our, you know, our criminal population so that we can at least affect the recidivism rate? Now, Kathy, you, you've been involved with kids at risk, and you understand this community. And in fact, a, a lot of you. Um, and you know my background. I was a DARE officer with the Drug Abuse Resistance Education. I worked with the, uh, the PAL program at the time, Police Activities League. Look forward to working with Boys and Girls Club. Uh, I, I, I'm working with Youth at Risk and Camp Rosenbaum. I, I just, I'm just somebody that cares deeply and understands that there are consequences for everything you choose to do or choose not to do. These kids are making big choices and big mistakes, and they're losing their, the rest of their life for it. And in some cases, I'm sorry, but rightfully so. These have huge consequences for family and whatnot. But in other cases, we are having situations where we wouldn't even revisit this. They were involved in a crime at age 15 or 16, and we couldn't even revisit this. With the mandatory sentence law, that's just the bottom line. They're going to go and... And, and the, the thing I found nuts was, and we didn't correct it, I'm hoping we can, is that in these cases, these folks will just stay in the, the Oregon Youth Authority until they reach a certain age, and then they will be moved out into the large penitentiary. Now, I met a young man, uh, Brian Pham is his name, P-H-A-M. You can Google it. You'll find out that Brian Pham is a Beaverton resident. He was a young kid. He was 17 years old. He and his friends went to Denny's one night and decided they were going to rob his girlfriend's grandmother. This is all public record. I don't mind talking about it. And uh, had, I, had I not known any of this and met this man, I just would have thought, what a dynamic young individual. He's got a whole future ahead of him. Well, the reality is Brian Pham was sentenced. He, what he did was terrible. It was egregious. He broke into the home, home invasion robbery of his girlfriend's grandmother, put her into the bathroom, tried to get the code to a safe. When she wouldn't give it, he put a knife to her throat. Now, he didn't, didn't stab her, but it doesn't matter. The reality is he's charged with a burglary one, a robbery one, Okay, a kidnap, and he's going to this, you know, to the OIA, and he's under mandatory lock. Should be, he earned it. But what's he done since then? He's now got an associate's degree. He's working towards a bachelor's. He is the mentor to all the young kids coming into the door. The reality is Brian Pham will be in there till he's 25. He'll move into the Department of Corrections, into the large big house, without anybody reviewing his record and seeing the history of what he's done. And I personally think, like, the victim should be able to weigh in. The deputy district attorney should be able to weigh in. We should be able to have a process that gives you a second look and says, look, this kid made some big mistakes. The victim forgives him. She's proud of what he's accomplishing now. She just wants him to be a better citizen. But we're going to risk all this great work that he's done and the investment that we as Oregonians have made to just simply send a message that we are crime and punishment, period, and send him to the, the Department of Corrections. My friends at the firehouse, they think, oh, you're getting soft on us. It's like, no, I'm not getting soft. I'm being logical. If we can save money, if we can do an evidence-based outcome, if we can show that Brian Pham has turned his life around and he's better without sending him into the big house where he's going to be chosen, not, not whether or not you're going to join a gang, but just matter of fact, which one you're going to be a part of, I think we're better for it. Because the numbers are staggering. $30,000 to incarcerate, $10,000 er, $10, to educate, $30,000 to incarcerate. That's what the governor says. That's ridiculous. Our monies could be better spent. So what we did is pass the bill with very slight modifications to some of, the, some of the sentencing guidelines. None of it measure 11, none of it violent offenders. But the money that is saved will go directly into our community programs. So the chiefs of police were all involved. The sheriff's office, uh, were, all the sheriffs were involved. The district attorneys were all involved and in favor. It was amazing, the group that came together. But one or two, I'm going to say one, but I'm going to say or two, just in case there was another one silent. One or two victims' advocates groups, so they say, despite all the other victims' advocates groups being in favor, because money goes into their programs as well, they, speak to, they spoke opposed to it. And they'll be the ones that will send your mailbox full of Greg Matthews released violent offenders into your community. And it's simply not true. We can do better. So speaking of do better, so that, that was one assignment. It was interesting, and again, that's one of those where you just know that this is your mission. You know, it's going to be difficult. It's going to get awkward. You're going to talk about things on the table of rape, one sodomy, and, and, and all this is going to be out there. But you have to have that discussion because you have to have the process and you have to have better policy in the end. And we got there. And I'm proud that we passed that. It's unfortunate that it was chosen to be 
political posturing because, to be honest, that bill should have come out 60 and 0 out of the House with the work that went on. With my Republican colleagues on the panel that all voted in favor as well, with their background, Andy Olson, state trooper and former, you know, administrator state trooper, Wally Hicks, a, a deputy district attorney, I mean, all this great background. We should have all joined as a caucus and supported each other. That didn't happen. They were counting the votes who they could let off the hook and who they couldn't. That's the reality of Salem that, that frustrates me to no end. So, in addition, I, got, I, got, I was given the assignment, and this was like, this was my, you know, one was a tough job, this was the dream job. I was given the opportunity to be the, uh, the chair of the Veterans and Emergency Services Committee uh, and Emergency Preparedness, uh, which, given, again, my background of, I'm a veteran, I was in the U.S. Army, I was a paratrooper and served in uh, Operation Urgent Fury, which was the invasion of Grenada. I came home to be a police officer, I was a police officer of Gresham for 11 years, then fire, uh, you know, fire and life safety. So now I've been a firefighter for about 16 years, 27 years total within the city. And now here we are dealing with the veterans issues, which I gotta tell you uh, is really rewarding. Here's the problem. Legislators only given X amount of bills for priority. So we come down, we wanna get MGET funded, we wanna get these things funded, those things funded. And even with the veterans that, that are in the legislature, they sometimes forget about, we gotta save some priority for, for the veterans. And, and so in this case, we were able to do that. Now, my, you know, our good senator is also the vice chair on the Senate side and has done amazing work for veterans, so we, we join again. But the reality, what we did for veterans this session will be what I've always said we should be doing. Forget about, you know, forget about the parades, forget about a photo opportunity. What we've done is now policies and programs in place that are gonna help these veterans forever. As an, as an example, we call it no wrong door. Veterans will now be asked when they get in touch with state services at DHS or the Bureau of Labor or DMV through ODOT. They'll be asked, are you a veteran? They'll now be a new form checked on the box. They're a veteran. If they want, it's totally up to the veteran. If they choose to be, to, to be uh, checked as a veteran, then their name can be forwarded with their permission to the ODVA, the Department of Veterans Affairs. The great thing with that is ODVA will then do a search of the benefits that they've earned and see if they have anything out there that they should be collecting. Long term, what's that do? Well, here's, here's the numbers. 330,000 veterans are residing in Oregon today that we know of, 330. About 100,000 of them are collecting their benefit. That's it. That's less than a third that are collecting benefits that they've earned. So where are they? Well, they could be potentially on some other state programs, some other county programs, and they could be bringing in other dollars when there's $4.2 billion of federal monies that's earmarked to support the veterans. We've got to find a way to access that, those dollars, and we've got to get the veterans to come forward with us. So we've, we've done that, uh, which was great. In-state tuition. Uh, we were able to, to include veterans for in-state tuition. If you're a veteran, you moved to Oregon, you show a desire to live here, you'll be charged the in-state tuition rate. And with the help of the great senator, we, we also did uh, the Purple Heart. So if you're a recipient of Purple Heart, your kids are going to be waived into the university system. It's just incredible that we'll be able to do that and working, and, and here's the reality. In my first term and second term, these things were off the table. We just couldn't get there. And I don't know why, they got gummed up somewhere, but working together, following through, uh, Chair Boquist on the Senate side, working with uh, Senator Monis Anderson, we just worked in, in unison. And we got these things done because they mattered greatly to us. So, so veterans aren't gonna get this big lottery win, uh, so to speak, even though we were trying. Uh, and what we're trying to do is a raffle, much like the one that are now, you know, the Oregon Lottery System canceled the uh, Thanksgiving raffle, they've replaced it with a Halloween raffle. It's a scratch it ticket. Those generate roughly $1.2 million each time they release a raffle. We do two of those in the, in the state now. It's by rule, it's not by statute, so we don't need a law to pass, but, but the, the reality is our veterans need help. They need help on the, uh, the reintegration, they're gonna need help on the mental uh, and stress disabilities. They're coming back with the traumatic brain injuries. I mean, we are fighting the war and have fought the war different than any other year. And if we've done nothing from the Vietnam era, let's at least say we've learned. These are young folks coming back and they're not given time to, to have a soft landing. They're, given, they're getting thrown right back into their community and there's just something wrong. These are some great fine men and women that, that have signed on the dotted line and volunteered to serve. If we don't treat them appropriately, we will be back into a draft situation. Because what is appealing to a 15-year-old right now to say, I want to join the Army, I want to join the Navy, you know, 
where's that kid going to be in three years from now if these are more exposures and, and we have bigger problems and we're not addressing them? So really, my big push is how do we get the access to the veterans to get the benefits they deserve? And that's, that's really where I was at. In the end, the session, uh, I, I learned something every time. Uh, I've had the advantage now of being in a session with 36 Democrats, being in a 30-30 session, and now being in one with 34. So I say, you know, it, it has been different every time. The reality to me is if one party thinks they can control the building and the state, we will do a disservice to Oregonians. I honestly think that the day we start counting chairs and continue to think that the green leather chair I sit in is blue or red, that's a mistake. For me, I think the reality is, particularly in our county, we all know, people don't label themselves as Democrat or Republican out in East County. They are voters. They are responsible citizens. They want somebody that's responsible and, and reactive to their needs. I really don't believe that the majority of people out there are looking down ticket on every issue. I think it's more important than that. And so that's why literature from us continues to go out to Democrats and registered Republicans and non-affiliated voters because, quite honestly, they're all engaged and it's been a privilege and an honor to represent everybody in East Multnomah County and Gresham. So that's all I have for you right now and I'll turn my time over. I think I, I uh, have come close for you. And thank you, Kathy, and thank you all for being here. And, and to the hundreds in the back that couldn't quite hear me, I just want to say um, we will get to your questions. I'll stay after for you as well and the millions of viewers at home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Matthews, and I really appreciate you being straightforward with us about the issue of the second look. I, I did do my letters, I did do my phone calls very diligently about that and sent information to others. Um, and, and I think that that's, I, just very quickly I'd like to say that in, just at home uh, there's a house in my neighborhood that's been a drug house. We worked with Gresham Police Department. We wrote down license plate numbers. We called the owner of the house. But we didn't just sit and wait for others to, to take care of the situation. And I think this is kind of what you're conveying, is that we have to be responsible citizens overall and not just expect others to you know, weave this magic spell. So this is excellent information, and I know that Lori has further information for us, and we're anxious to hear about the Senate side of what the 2013 session was about. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you to the League of Women Voters. It's a group that I am a member of, and I'm very proud of what you do in East Multnomah County. I am Lori Monis Anderson, and I represent Gresham, Troutdale, Wood Village, Fairview, and now with the redistricting, I'm moving a little bit into uh, Portland. Uh, it's, I graduated from Gresham High. Uh, my parents were teachers in the school district. I was a public health nurse in this district, uh, going and working with at-risk families, uh, drug-addicted moms, drug-affected babies. Uh, my kids, two ki grown kids now graduated from Gresham High, and I am now a grandmother, and I that is the most special thing in the world uh, to me. But I am very, very proud of what we did uh, in the legislature. It's not easy, and it's very stressful, but we uh, had 2,679 bills introduced this in 2013, and we passed over 850 bills. Uh, I had 27 of them, and out of that, I had 22 of my bills passed. So uh, it does take working together, and when I take a look at my team from e that I'm a part of from East um, Multnomah County, Representative Gorsuch, the education guru, I think, and Representative Matthews is the public safety guru, and I feel I am the health care guru, and that's where over 90% of our tax dollars in, from the general friend go to, to educate, to incarcerate, and to give health care, all right? So you have good representation from, from this group. Um, my goal, of course, was to increase education funding. I think you've already heard that. We did. We did a substantial job. We had been cutting teachers. Our class sizes are getting bigger, and uh, the school days, we've had to cut school days. 
So with a billion dollars of increase, we are cutting back on that, and I'm very proud of what we've done with the education budget. Um, but we also increased uh, money for the community colleges. Um, uh, and also, we gave money to the need-based aid for those who want to go into the university system. Eight million dollars went to Mount Hood Community College, and they are going to be using that for remodeling, for student facility services, for centralizing a lot of groups, uh, uh, a lot of departments, uh, registration, academic advising, career counseling. They're going to do a lot with that eight million dollars. And because a lot of that is going to, they will need to hire people uh, too uh, if there's uh, capital construction. And so that is, I'm very proud uh, that we are um, being able to, you know, provide jobs in, in our community. Also, uh, what everyone is going to see is the Oregon Opportunity Initiative. And that is, uh, will be on the 2014 ballot. You know that college affordability is extremely difficult for some of the people. And to me, it is so sad that a, a, chi a child, a student, is not able to continue his education or her education because they don't have the funds. Now, this is a concept that we will want the people, the public, to weigh in on. Are you willing to have a pay it forward, pay it back? And basically, in essence, a percentage of, the, of a person's future earnings would be taken out to pay for their college education. It's a new concept. It makes education, I feel, affordable, and because it's a percentage of what you earn after you get out, those that make more will be able to pay a little more, and those that don't make, well, every, it will be uh, even. So I, I'm very excited about what we're doing there. Um, we also, you know, as the economy gets better, job creation remains a very top issue. And we did pass a number of important bills uh, to help grow jobs in Oregon. We actually improved access uh, to capital for small businesses. We increased the availability of industrial lands so that business can grow and expand in our state. And we also streamlined some economic development programs that give businesses a jump start. We increased um, transparency for Buy Oregon. It's a program that encourages state agencies to buy more Oregon-made products. We need to have jobs in this state, and this is one way that we can create jobs. It's a, it also, um, this is a good step toward transparency in, in, in government. So I'm, I'm excited about what we were doing uh, regarding jobs. You know, the, the gov government can't create jobs, but we can facilitate the opportunity for businesses to grow and to uh, provide um, capital construction and transportation dollars so we can put people uh, back to work. As you know, we have a, a terrible gang problem in East Multnomah County, and um, we at this table have worked very hard every session to make sure that East Metro, uh, it's called MGET, East Metro Gang Enforcement Team uh, Program monies, um, get funded. We have a very low tax base here, and uh, without this money, we would not be able to have the, the, that program to start working with the gangs, with the children, trying to prevent children from going into gangs. And in talking with some of the police who are part of that team, uh, it's exciting what they're doing, working with the families and uh, going into their homes, uh, providing, actually just being present. It's amazing what they know, and if you ever want to have an, uh, someone talk to you about uh, what the MGET team does, uh, it's a wonderful pre presentation. Um, PERS reform is a very controversial issue down uh, in the legislature, but I'm very glad that we were able to address 
it in a modest way. Uh, we actually have reduced the liability by $2.6 billion. I mean, that is huge. And so um, I'm not sure if, if we will be able to get any more. A lot, we are very concerned about the contracts that are made with our public employees and we need to know if they're going to hold up in court. So we will see what the future holds if there's going to be uh, any more. Anymore. Now I'm a nurse, and I um, chair the Senate Health Policy Committee, and I am very excited about Oregon being cutting edge on health care reform in the nation. And, uh, it helps to have two physicians and a nurse, as well as a governor who, who was a, a physician, to be there. And I, we are cutting edge, so we're not quite sure exactly how this is going to turn out. But we can't continue in the way healthcare is delivered now. It is costing us way too much money, and we just can't afford it. And there are many, many, many people not being able to have health care uh, coverage. And I am a person who absolutely believes that no one, no one should be denied health care access. And so we have done a number of things. We have created um, coordinated care organizations. Part of what our tax dollars pay for is an insurance program. It's called the Oregon Health Plan. For those who, who are eligible, there's a, a number that are, but there's still a number that aren't and still don't have he health insurance, and we want to have everyone uh, be a part of, of some kind of uh, health care delivery. And it's been in, in uh, the, we call it the coordinated care organizations, and it's been in existence now for a year, just a year, brand new. We're starting look, to look at the matrix to see. We want it to ha be evidence-based outcomes. They have a global budget, so they only get a certain amount of money, yet we do not want them to deny access to care. They just have to figure out, hey, why don't we start focusing on prevention? And prevention is a key in cutting our health care dollars. And so that's what these coordinated care organizations are doing. For instance, asthma horrendous amount of, of, of patients that go to the ER. You just need a little bit of prevention to prevent those emergency room visits. The same with diabetes and, or, and high blood pressure, overweight. So we're hoping that our coordinated care organizations are going to be a model, a model for the nation to show how we can save money, health care tax dollars, by the way we work uh, with our, um, with our health care delivery. And we want to include mental health and addictions and dental and health care. You can't separate mental health, physical health, your dental. And, and so this, I, I'm excited regarding the first uh, uh, results of the matrix that they're uh, offering us that they are saving some money. So, if we can do this with our Medicaid population, then why can't we do it for the rest of, of Oregonians? So I'm hoping that it'll work. The other thing that we are doing uh, is Cover Oregon. You might have seen some of the advertisements. This program will, is actually going to help small businesses and individuals to help them better access uh, insurance. They'll be able to compare apples to apples. And it's online. It's going to take a while to get the kinks out, but uh, it's supposed to go start October 1st. And uh, I am very excited uh, that we have this now large pool, a large pool of people who will be in the Cover Oregon. And when you have a large pool in a, in, in a health insurance exchange, uh, you, you spread the risk. And, and therefore the cost sh should come down. So we've, we really are trying to decrease costs um, in healthcare and I'm, I'm optimistic that it, it's, of course I am an optimist. Uh, we may have some problems, but I'm optimistic that we're going to get through it. Um, I worked very hard on the prescription drug monitor, monitoring program. Um, 
we have many, many deaths and a lot of drug abuse with prescription drugs. And we have to track that some, somehow because there are people who drug shop. They go from doctor to doctor to doctor. And so we, the state of Oregon, have uh, developed the prescription drug monitoring program. Well, it's been in existence for a year, and we're finding there are some problems, as with any legislation that we pass. The doctors are saying they don't have time to look at, at um, to see if someone is abusing the system. And so we uh, actually expanded it so they can delegate a physician assistant or an, another medical assistant, uh, someone who can actually go to the computer and data enter and just see if this person is drug shopping. And so uh, I'm, it is a very, very serious problem in Oregon. We, wanna, we have one of the highest prescription drug abuse in the nation. And so uh, we have to address that issue. So I'm, I'm very excited about what we have done then to that. Um, finally, uh, I, well, second to finally, uh, I also serve on small business and consumer protection. And I think that Representative Matthews mentioned it. I am considered a moderate. And the liberals get very mad at me sometimes. Uh, and the conservatives get mad at me sometimes. And I think that's why I was put on the Small Business and Consumer Pr Protection uh, Committee, because I am that moderate voice. I'm not saying it's the right voice, but uh, I, I, I stick to the middle and uh, made a lot of people unhappy and killed a lot of bills by being on that, on that committee. But it's, I have to vote what my core says, I, how I should vote. And, um, and that was one committee. It was my first session being on that committee. It, it was a little tough because, you know, I'm a nurse and I like to make people feel good and get better and all that. And, and sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and say, sorry, I know I'm going to have an enemy on this one. So, but then my, my love, um, my passion, of course, is health care. But my love is for the veterans. And I was very honored to be vice chair of the Veterans Committee. Um, my first exposure to veterans was uh, during the Vietnam War era. And I was one of those that volunteered uh, with the Air Force to fly uh, in and out of Vietnam. Cameron Bay and Saigon were the two cities that we would fly into, pick up the GIs, and take them on their two-week R&R, either to Guam, Honolulu, or Tokyo. That was my route. And um, I remember the first time those GIs came onto that uh, airplane. You know, I was 24 years old. I was, you know, young and very naive. And, um, and there was like a gray face coming on board with vacant eyes, very serious. And these were guys my age or younger. And it was my first exposure to what war is really all about. And that's why I feel so strongly um, to serve on, on the um, Veterans Committee because we ostracized um, Vietnam vets um, back in, in my era. It was a, a, a just an unwanted war. And, and now we have actually been passing legislation that is finally saying, welcome home. Vietnam veterans. And one of the cool bills, it's not a serious bill, but I like it. We are going to uh, name, uh, it'll be on Veterans Day, um, I-84, starting in Portland all the way uh, to the Idaho border, uh, the Vietnam Memorial Highway. We have other memorial highways for veterans, but not specifically for the Vietnam War Memorial. So that that is very meaningful, and we had uh, Val Shaw and, and several others from this community um, come and testify in front of our Veterans Committee, com committee on how important just that is for, a Viet for the Vietnam vets. And so I'm proud that we are doing that. We, that you know that suicide, we, we in Oregon have some of the highest suicides of Vietnam veterans in the nation, and um, so we put more funding to help that. Uh, we also, um, the college uh, tuition, uh, we also helped. So um, 
that's sort of a summary of what I focused on. I'm, I'm very, very, very honored to be uh, your state senator, and um, we look forward to trying to solve some more problems. Thanks, Kathy, and League of Women Voters. Well, I think that we realize that we haven't covered all the thousands of bills that you covered, yeah. but excellent information. And I believe what I'll do is uh, wrap up, uh, and I'm glad that Greg uh, alluded to membership and how important membership in League of Women Voters and, and other uh, civil rights or uh, organizations are. And I would encourage our TV viewers to check out our website that will be uh, displayed on the monitor. And there are many ways now, thanks to the electronic revolution, how, how people can be connected to learning and finding out about legislative matters. So I would just encourage our audience, TV audience, to realize that there are new opportunities for membership, and we'll be exploring those throughout this coming year. We've already been addressing that and working on that. And um, also that there are some hot topics. This is just the opening for this year. We're going to be providing community conversations uh, out on a month-by-month -month basis, uh, especially toward the spring. So you'll be hearing more about that coming up. So I know we have just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to open up to questions. And I know the tape will cut off. But uh, I know that they'll be here to answer your questions. And for the, the uh, cable audience, the legislative representatives are very accessible. You can go online. There are just many ways, so I encourage them also to do that. So thank you very much. And we're very pleased and honored to have our representatives with us today. So I will open it up to audience questions. And who will be the first? I believe these microphones here, and the new electronic media, should pick up any of your questions. I have a question about Columbia River Crossing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If anybody has ever been over there in Van going mm -hmm. across to Vancouver, they know what a mess that is. What can be done about it, and why should Oregon fund Mm -hmm. fund it by themselves, or why are we always pushing for the MAX line going across where they don't want it? I think that um, the MAX uh, line brings in a lot of funding that is necessary so that the <coughs> bridge uh, can be built. Um, I was talking actually just yesterday uh, to one of the representatives from Vancouver. And I said, what's the matter with you? You know, uh, we're going to toll you to death if we do this, you know. Uh, uh, because it should be, it should be just a bi-state uh, endeavor. Absolutely. But it is critical. It is critical to have that bridge. And so if, if there is an opportunity to be able to uh, fund that, that um, through bonding, that, um, that won't hurt the taxpayers, uh, I, I want it. it w our economy is such, especially if we have some seismic event, and then that bridge will definitely fall apart. But there is just one legislator in, basically, uh, in, uh, according to my sources, uh, that is, I think, from the Seattle area that uh, has a lot of influence on what transportation dollars uh, are, you know, are available to where, and um, because she's from the Seattle area doesn't quite, I think, understand the significance. I do not know, but I am saying that I am not opposed to any kind of a plan that's reasonable and isn't going to put us, you know, won't make Oregon bankrupt so that we can get a bridge uh, built. I think, I think what I would add to that, and I'm supportive of the, the CRC, and I have been for a couple of years now, more so than just about the jobs it creates. I mean, I think that's a, a definite benefit, getting people back to work and what it does, and to move commerce, because that, that bridge is a problem. But I think also having now learned of the problems that are, that are being created as a result of the indecision, 
you know, I think it should be a shared, uh, a shared application of the bridge. I think that Washington should be joining us. But what's happening is, uh, and Speaker Tina Kotek, it's her district. So, uh, it, which is a bit ironic. You're the Speaker of the Oregon House and you're trying to help your people and uh, you know, your constituents. And you look at Hayden Island uh, where they now call it Lottery Row. And so what you have is a stretch of lotteries. <laughs> some say, some, some will call them casinos disguised as delis. Um, but, but what you have is a, a, a group of folks that are just running lottery and nobody willing to invest into that community. Meanwhile, just across the street, there's families living in conditions of homes that they purchased as investments that, that are just, you know, this beautiful area. And yet they're seeing their property go down in value. And more importantly, they're worried about their children walking to the bus stop, uh, taking public transportation. Uh, I will say that we did take that issue head on um, because I was, I was opposed to just calling everybody selling lottery a casino. I didn't think that was a fix. But I took that head on. We worked with the Hayden Island and that fo those folks on Lottery Row, got everybody involved in the room, including Portland Police Bureau. And we now have an agreement with them where they're providing security per business uh, for a rotation of not just daylight hours, you know, and evening hours, but it's a long time rotation. And they have to come out in the parking lot and do sweeps every 30 minutes. I mean, it is, and it's all through the Portland Police Bureau uh, authorizing, you know, this plan. It's helping some, it doesn't cure the problem. But in the end, we're not going to get anybody to invest in that community. And I'll, I'll use the example of Rockwood. We want Rockwood beautification to happen. We want the investment to occur. The county courthouse does, I think, amazing things towards that. I think having the police precinct built on 181 is going to help as well because people will see if the county, if the city, if people are willing to invest in there, then perhaps maybe that's where I should put my investment dollars for business. And I think the same thing occurs in Hayden Island. But right now, there is so much uncertainty that you're not going to find anybody spend money there and the lottery will continue and the citizens are frustrated. Meanwhile, what they have to look forward to if it does happen is a lot of dirt, a lot, a lot of gravel, a lot of dust and, and a real inconvenience. But in the end, if it's all benefiting commerce, if it's moving people and property about and uh, releasing that, that you know, bottleneck that occurs, then I think it's all for the better. But we have to be in partnership with it. Oregon can't afford to do it alone, nor should we. Another question. Yeah, I have one. Okay, Lori. Um, I don't, uh, could you go over again the, the Oregon Opportunity Initiative? I am so, I, I can't get my head around it, and mm -hmm. I think we should do something about higher ed, final. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and this mm -hmm. seems to be the, well, I, I'm not the best person to actually explain it because I did not serve on an education committee. Uh, I gathered this from the caucus. Uh, what, what I understand is that it is paid for, your college education is paid for. And then once you graduate, um, you then par a, a percentage of your income, and I don't know what that percentage will be, and I don't even think that that has been decided, will go into a fund. Uh, at the state level um, um, and so that's all I know about it I don't know if you know anything more about it no, Representative that's, Gorsuch that's essentially what's out there the idea then is that over time people pay into the fund the fund gets larger and it can support more students and then it's able to expand accordingly um, but the idea here is that it's fundamentally different from what goes on now um, when you get student loans, which many people, that's how they support their education, you end up paying a fair amount of interest. In fact, I believe that the federal um, in interest rate just went up. It, it doubled, which is You're something we to tried to stop. Um, mm -hmm. We sent our own complaints um, to the federal system about that. But the idea is that you spend a lot of money then, after the fact, paying on those rates. Here, it takes the interest out of it you're simply paying back what, um, what you've already gained. And it is, I think, as the Senator said, something that is fairly low in, your, uh, in the amount that it impacts your day-to-day your -day income so that people, A, can afford it, B, you cut out all of that lost money due to interest, and over time, the system should develop to the point where it's self-sustaining. 
So you would see um, a huge investment by students for students and that would actually reduce the state's burden um, in the long haul for, for higher ed. But that is something that once we get closer to ballot time, right. um, it'll be extremely important for the agency to get a, an easy one pager right. so that we all can really understand it. Right. Yeah, uh, that, that is my concern. If we all have to understand what's mm -hmm. going on, well, well, sometimes we aren't informed voters, but we should be. Yes. And we're not going to be informed if right? we can't even figure this out. Mm -hmm. Well, and on the topic of education, too, that even with the uh, with the change we made in reforms and trying to improve our budget, we were only able to reduce the actual tuition increase from the 5% it was marked for to about 3.5. So we continually hear from students, and particularly Mount Hood, they, they're very, very organized uh, student mm -hmm. association there. It, it's great. And, uh, and they're constantly saying, we just cannot afford school and we don't want it for free but we want to find a way and right. and so you're you're exactly right i i do think a lot of voters are trying to get informed a lot of information out there but it, it does get convoluted and for us to be you know and i'll just speak for myself some bills that are interesting concept and it sounds like it's just that simple it'll be in an 82 page document and you're wondering like <laughs> why that's true why all of this mm -hmm. when what we're talking about here is one sentence and and yet you get into the details of it and you realize this isn't the way to fix it, but it's important we identify the problem. Now let's find solutions. There's another piece to this, too, besides just the tuition. Um, textbook costs are astronomical. And, um, you know, that's more of a federal jurisdictional issue, but students are also drowning in debt just from paying all of the textbooks and everything else that goes along with classes. But as a teacher, I need the book. So, you know, on the one hand, I need the book to have that support for the class. On the other hand, I'm not unaware of the cost and the impact on my students. So um, where I can, I try to use older editions and put things on reserve and do things that lower the cost. But, but you know, the extra pieces also are a problem. It's, it's not just tuition. And I had a bill that actually would require Representative Gorsuch to do FaceTime. Yeah. yeah. But, and I thanked you for that. But I just, I, I couldn't get that passed. I know. My Facebook. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for K through 12, uh, they have more money. Are there going to be more days that these kids are going to be in classrooms? Or is that uh, still? Gresham Barlow said that they were able to add back days. And, but they still had to cut staff because their PERS liability they had to pay three million dollars more. Now that was last session. I don't uh, last year. I don't know what it'll be th this year. Had to pay three million dollars more, and so that's why you know there's this big push because it's costing our schools a significant amount of money to pay for that PERS liability, and so these kids are off school so much. It's oh, I know. They should be going seven days a week, nine hours a day. <laughs> then maybe we'd have no gangs. <laughs> it's amazing how many days are out. It is, and, and it, it varies from region to region. So Gresham Barlow, you know, I dropped my daughters off. My wife did yesterday uh, for the first day of school, and my middle schooler today at West Orient. And, uh, and yet we were in Bend last week, and kids in the Bend area were already going to school. So mm -hmm. it, every... Every area is different, and uh, and I agree with you. It's we got to try to add back those days, yeah, and exactly. and yet I'm I'm not willing to blame the teachers for that. Uh, we have to find solutions. Mm -hmm. We have one more question. <laughs> okay, I'll go. <laughs> 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 uh, I you know I'm wondering is anybody or is the state Go, are they looking at something similar for, uh, like David Douglas is doing with their uh, preschool um, in, in that area? To me, as a junior high and high school teacher, it would be an awful lot easier for me to have somebody coming up who has had a good mm -hmm. basic mm -hmm. education. And, and then I end to shove them out into some good higher education. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't care about that <laughs> because that will somehow take care of itself. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I agree. We did have the Early Learning Council. They are supposed to come up with some recommendations on how to address um, uh, the birth through five-year-old yeah. ages. And, um, but, you know, any type of change requires more tax dollars, and we're at least having the conversation. Uh, we have mandated um, uh, kindergarten now. But we have, you're absolutely right, we have to start earlier. We have funded a Head Start. Um, well, actually, that's federal, but um, we actually put some, I think, um, some general fund money into that, too, and we're trying to hold that steady or if increased. But again, I'm not on that committee, and I, uh, if you would want some of that information, I'd, I'd have my staff look it up for you. I think if you look at the governor's overall plan, which is 40, 40, 20. Um, I think there is a desire to take Oregon in that direction so that pre-K and then K through 12 and then higher ed, that it's all kind of seamless and that kids are prepared for each step along the way. But it's like the Senator said, it takes, it takes funding. Um, and we don't want this to simply be something that we set a framework up for, but then we don't follow through putting the pieces in place and getting the money there. So having the overall plan is a good start, but I think now we have to find the funding that will sustain it um, in a way that it really works. I think too, it's a, you know, I mean, when you look at the governor's plan, uh, starting with Rudy Crew, oh wait, he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. Too soon? Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, the 40-40-20, it, it really, it's only going to work if, if all those students- the 40 20 for the audience. Okay, so 40% of the students. Graduate from college. 40% graduate with a secondary degree and 20% graduate with a high school degree. So, in sorry, order, sorry. no, 40% high school, 40% right. uh, college, college. And, then, and then 20% grad. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. with the 40, 40, 20, that, that's hinging on the fact that every student wants to further into college. That's true. And, and what that doesn't account for are the folks that are perhaps on their family farm. Uh, you know, and, 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 and their livelihood is going to be, you know, out there in the farm. It's going to be within, you know, mom and dad's business in the, in the mom and pop store. And so they'll still be counted in as part of that equation on whether or not we're succeeding. I think that that's a mistake. Um, I, I just, uh, and that's my, my philosophy. I think it's a great goal to have, but you have to be able to, to look at it and say, first of all, is it attainable, you know, realistically? And second of all, are you removing the factors of the students that, they graduated high school and then they joined the military, you know, and, and, and they just had successful careers beyond that, so they never came into the college. That wouldn't mean that Oregon failed. That would just simply mean that not every student is cut out to continue the education in college. Um, and so it'll be really interesting to see how that all plays out. And the, the, the comment about the kindergarten end of it, the, the issue I had with kindergarten was with the bill that, that would mandate full-day kindergarten, um, as an example, it sounds like a great idea in theory. We didn't have any money for it. Secondly, our classroom sizes to the kindergartners, at the time, my youngest was in kindergarten in a classroom of 34 kids. Now, you know, I respect the teachers greatly. In fact, Bonnie Collada, if you're out there watching, I love you, Bonnie Collada. She's my former speech teacher. She's great. But I'll just say to, to the kindergarten teacher that is struggling with 34 kids in the classroom and then have that group all day long, I don't necessarily think that was a, a, a very effective strategy, particularly given that we split our kids now to a morning and an afternoon session. So now take all of those kids, put them all into one school that's not big enough as it is, you've got a real problem. So we weren't prepared for it. These are great goals. These are things that we should be talking about and how do we achieve them. But to put them into statute and pretend we're gonna get there, I don't know that that's so smart. But it becomes a benchmark and now we've inherited it. So we'll see what happens. And it'll, it'll, I think it's really important to have the school districts come and tell you how they are addressing uh, that issue because I think there's some really success stories out there but well, it is moving the money around and there shouldn't be more than 18 to 20 in a kindergarten class but what you point out is very true um, we focus so much on the negatives and there are a lot of excellent teachers as uh, Representative Matthews just referred um, and they're not all you know engineering and math teachers uh, we need art teachers and we need social science 
social studies teachers and we need music. Um, we need all of those things. And we know that some students we will lose when we drop out things like music and art and say, well, that's extra and we don't need it. We need to develop the whole child, not just you know, pieces of the child. Um, but it's absolutely true. This system isn't going to function if it's not properly funded. Um, and that's the key. It all, it, I hate to say it, but it always comes back to the proper funding. But, but also, uh, as a society, you know, people really have to make the choice yeah. whose responsibility is it to raise their children. And our schools and, and our, we always say teachers, and that's really a blanket statement for everybody associated within the district. I mean, there, there are some fabulous people that are attached to those schools that, that are doing incredible things that aren't teachers. They're simply the person you see at the front. They're, they're, they're folks that, you know, uh, whether it be Eddie or Nick and, and their custodial staff, I mean, these are just great folks. Bottom line is, parents have to have their children ready to learn. They have to prepare them to learn. They have to provide them the tools, and they have to give them the time. And I'm, I'm a product of it, you know. Every now and then, it's time to shut these things off. It's time to quit checking the email. It's time to have the conversation with the kids and to get back to school because I'm worried about the society we raise where kids are going to be doing more texting than they are talking. Right. And what we really need to do is, you know, communication base as we move forward to the future and take advantage of the tools and resources. But let's not forget that uh, still the most effective way to communicate is verbally one-on-one. -on -one. But half of the, uh, the families, or all of the families that I worked with were at-risk families. And they weren't, they don't have their education. They don't know what skills to convey. And that's why the Early Learning Council will bring into the broader picture of the environment at the home. And uh, because that, that is a key issue when you have broken families, when you have a mother or a father that's not there to actually help them uh, or learn. If or if they're both working. Or if they're both working. So, uh, you know, it's a huge issue. It's not the teacher's fault, that's for sure. <laughs> well, just one other, one comment to add to that before we go to the last question. <laughs> <laughs> is the ACE Academy that yes. mm -hmm. is... Uh, all the, I believe all the East County schools participate in, and that's about carpentry, that's about mm -hmm. plumbing, that's incredible. about all these incredible skills that are so necessary uh, and part of an educated workforce as well. So somehow I think that that has mm -hmm. to be integrated into that 40-40-20 plan because oh, that's absolutely. a success. I think it is, yeah. And, and, yeah. and a direction that many of our students and I appreciate you mentioning that. These, these students, I mean, if you, if you want to be impressed, yeah. well, so many of these young kids will impress you, but, but the ACE graduation at the end of the year celebration when they reveal their projects, I saw a, a young man, met a young man that restored a, I think it was a 72 Ford Bronco, just from <laughs> ground up. Uh, somebody else built a Frisbee thrower, a robotic Frisbee thrower for his dog. Um, you know, I... I would do this, but <laughs> it's pretty cool. But they're, they're just doing amazing things, and, and they are leaving with construction skills. And, and these, aren't just, these aren't just, you know, young men. These are young women, too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those are the folks that will come out, end up into a, a workforce, learning how to weld. Next thing you know, they're certified, and they're, they're making very great family wages without that college degree. And yet, I think we would all rule them as very successful. And, and won't we be glad when the Columbia River Crossing Bridge is built that they have those skills? That's absolutely all right. right. Last question. Okay, we're all concerned about the economic development, but I'm hearing a lot of complaints from business people that they say it's so impossible to get anything done between the city, the county, the state. Mm -hmm. There's roadblocks, there's fees, there's all this process. and. A lot of them are ready to fold and move to Washington. That's sad. Mm -hmm. Something needs to be done about this. I think a prime example is the lavender farm out on Redland Road, Clackamas County. But here they've come in and, and have done miraculous things with this ground. And, and they're, the county wants to put them out of business because they're not meeting all of the, the regulations. Mm -hmm. and, what can be done about this? That is a local issue, the county and the city. And um, we, we actually have developed a clearinghouse for small businesses mm -hmm. at the state level this last session uh, that businesses really wanted so that their complaints are, you know, it's just a communication system. 
uh, it may address some of that issues. But I, I need to point out there was one business that just got so fed up with the city of Gresham they moved to Washington. Within five years they were back here. And so, um, you know, I don't know if another state is better than, than here. I, I've heard those same complaints, and I think that our own Gresham City Council has tried to address some of the issues. Now, that's just for the city of Gresham. Mm -hmm. The county is another issue. I, I'm not sure. And then Clackamas County is entirely different. So it's really important to have good representation at the county and, and then have these problems reported so that maybe something could be done because we want these businesses to thrive. And that's that, uh, I alluded to that earlier, the Office of Small Business Assistance, I think, can be some help in, in terms of things like that. And that's brand new. Yeah, and we, you know, looking at local in terms of Gresham, I'm very proud of what Mayor Bemis and the council have done there. And, and they've been able to, you know, waive some of those initial fees and whatnot to bring somebody what they call from garage to Main Street. And, it, and it's been successful. In fact, downtown Gresham just feels great, very yeah. vibrant. And it's just got a lot of personality and, and a lot of excitement. Uh, I love it. Um, to say it's local and there's nothing we can do, I, I would say in most cases there's probably nothing we should do, but it wouldn't be uncommon for, say, a legislator in a particular area or particular county to bring forward something that would benefit, you know, their, their particular business. Um, in that instance, what it, what it then comes down to is for us to decide, is this really good policy for the state or can this be handled differently and managed differently? Sometimes what you'll have is a legislator that will just basically almost like draw a line in the sand and drop a threat. So they get a bill drafted to take care of a local issue. Mm -hmm. Probably never gets to the floor, might get a hearing, and then everybody's like, what in the, what are you doing on Lavender Farm? That's unacceptable. Those things can get straightened out. So there is some things that can be done, but overall a statewide policy to deal with the Lavender Farm specifically, I, I don't see us doing that, uh, particularly, uh, I won't because we're only given a couple of bills and I try to refer those mm -hmm. locally. I will say there's a family known as the Cyrus family, they own Aspen Lakes Golf Course in in Redmond, they're our sisters. They're very frustrated. They want to expand and do this big development, put a lot of people to work in a very depressed economy, and they can't get through the state land management. And I find it odd when people say, well, it's not the state's job because when another county had authorized some building in, in another portion of the state, the state did get involved, came in and stopped that down. So if it's a local issue, then we should have local control and we should be you know, very consistent in that process. If not, let's get in, but I really think uh, there's something those legislators can do to that area to help that, that farm out. But locally, uh, the good senator had a bill that we were working on trying to do something yeah. about the land use issue yeah. towards spring water and, and development. Trying to, mm -hmm. I won't even say level the playing field with Hillsborough, but Intel uh, certainly was opposing us. And, and I named them by name. Mm -hmm. uh, they like the way things are now. They have some land available out there. They can do some things for people to build in that land that makes it much more attractive than to develop in the Gresham area. We're hamstrung out here, and, and everybody needs to know. Uh, it was alluded to earlier. Our tax base is three sixty one a thousand, and that pays for everything. We currently have that seven dollar fifty cent uh, fee uh, on top of your your current water bill, and that's per month until July of two thousand fourteen. But really, to be honest, three sixty one a thousand paying for everything makes it difficult. If we can't attract business to this open land that we have, and if the state can't at least find a way to help us and we can't get everybody else to understand our issue uh, with the taxing uh, of the ballot measures and the impacts they've had, a negative impact, then we're gonna continue to be in this case of what do we do at 361 1,000? Citizens expect so much, and we deliver a lot, but what's sustainable for the future of the city of Gresham? And I know what kind of Gresham I wanna live in. It's the one I grew up in. Love this town. Well, thank you very much, and I, it, it's just, incredible information to have so that we can participate as citizens and build on the work that's been done for the and, and go into the next legislative session so thank you very thank you. much thank you. yes thank you all thank you.